we're joined by Erica Pinedo, an immigration attorney based in Tijuana, Mexico, and the policy and litigation director of Al Otro Lado, a binational nonprofit helping asylum seekers on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, she herself was targeted uh, by the Trump administration, monitored and surveilled. Um, Erica, if you can talk about this double standard, what it looks like where you are in Tijuana, we're not talking about uh, Ukrainian who are coming flying into the United States where they can find you know a lot of bureaucracy so they too are coming through the southern border but they're allowed in yes hi um, yeah we've seen thousands of Ukrainians coming through Tijuana um, their trips to Mexico are mostly financed by families and church groups in the United States um, who help them fly from Europe to Mexico City or Cancun and then onward to Tijuana. Uh, volunteer groups are standing by at the airport. Um, they're coordinating with CBP to give Ukrainians a number on a list. And CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection, are processing up to 1,000 Ukrainians per day at a port of entry where border officials claimed they did not have capacity to even process 30 other asylum seekers per day for the past few years. Um, the Tijuana government has also provided an enormous amount of resources to Ukrainian migrants, um, even giving them a municipal funded shelter um, where they have food, shelter, have a bedding, all kinds of services available to them. Um, months after they evicted violently uh, a camp of black and indigenous asylum seekers um, who had camped at the border for more than a year waiting for their chance to seek asylum, many of whom have now ended up homeless on the streets of Tijuana. And Erica, these reports are astounding. I, I, I've heard reports that there was a, a special line set up at the border crossing in Tijuana for just for Ukrainians, or sort of like a, a TSA line, a, a, a special priority line. Is that is that true? That is accurate. So part of the port of entry was closed down um, when Title 42 the COVID-related border restrictions were put into place in March of 2020. Um, Customs and Border Protection has since reopened this section of the port of entry, and it is solely dedicated to humanitarian processing of Ukrainians. As I mentioned, up to 1,000 are being transported there each day by church groups and are being processed in a very orderly fashion by CBP. So this shows us that Border officials do have the capacity to humanely process thousands of asylum seekers if they have the political will to do so. And the impact on others who are waiting, uh, for instance, uh, Hondurans and Guatemalans, there are, uh, appear to be more Ukrainians being processed for uh, asylum in a, in a few weeks than in an entire year of, of, of Salvadorans and Hondurans who have been uh, admitted for asylum in the, into the United States, despite decades of, of having the, some of the highest homicide rates in the world uh, in, uh, uh, in El Salvador and in Honduras. What's the impact on those who are waiting and watching this? Well. I can say for myself and, and also on behalf of many of the migrants with whom we work, everyone wants to support the Ukrainians. Of course, the war that they're fleeing is horrific. The way that they are being treated at the border is the way that everyone should be treated. So migrants who've been waiting for years now in deplorable conditions, many of whom have suffered rape, attempted kidnappings, assaults while waiting in these dangerous Mexican border cities are, of course, you know, hurt and angry at seeing Ukrainians being processed at this clip while they are left waiting. But it's it's worse than that, actually, since Ukrainians and even Russians have been coming to Tijuana in particular, whereas other asylum seekers could approach the border and ask for protection Previously, you know, of course, they would be turned away. But now Mexican law enforcement officials are posted at the border with an immigration van. If a Honduran even tries to approach border officials, they will be arrested and detained in a Mexican immigration prison for even attempting to seek safety in the United States. Erica, 
Axios reported on Tuesday that President Biden's inner circle has been discussing delaying the repeal of Title 42 border restrictions now set to end May 23rd. Again, these are the Trump-era pandemic restrictions that prevent people from coming into the United States on public health safety grounds. And these have been suspended for Ukrainians. But if you can talk about the number of Democrats and Republicans who have been demanding that Biden reimpose, extend Title 42, and what that means, as well as this double standard of Ukrainians not being subject to it, as uh, others are. So, part of the problem here is really the way that the media has been talking about the repeal of Title 42. I have seen numerous stories in which the migrants who have been waiting patiently at the border for the ports of entry to reopen have been characterized as a surge or a wave. Um, I've seen, you know, language referring to the repeal of Title 42 as a crisis. Now, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, estimates that approximately 25,000 asylum seekers uh, are waiting at the border uh, for Title 42 to be repealed. Now, again, keep in mind, in the past few weeks, U.S. border officials have processed over 10,000 Ukrainians. So again, they have the ability, the capacity to process uh, the number of asylum seekers who are waiting at the border easily in an orderly and humane fashion when the political will is there. Of course, the only difference here is that those waiting are largely black and indigenous um, and, you know, other asylum seekers who are not white Europeans. So, you know, I really believe that um, we need to start speaking about the migrants who are waiting in a different way. Uh, I think that's a huge part of the problem. Um, but it's really seeing that kind of rhetoric uh, in the media and seeing that repeated by members of Congress uh, who, frankly, should know better is extremely disappointing. And it's really dehumanizing uh, for folks who have been waiting patiently at the border for it to reopen. And Erica, there appears to be not only uh, clearly a, a, a racial context uh, to this uh, border policy, but also a political or foreign policy context. Uh, I, I, as I understand it, there's been a significant increase uh, in, over the past year in the number of Cubans crossing uh, into the United States along the Mexican border and getting asylum. Uh, we saw, for instance, back in the Central American War period, that uh, that Nicaraguans who were who were fleeing from the Sandinista rule uh, got much more uh, higher percentage of asylum grants uh, from the U United States than did Salvadorans uh, and Guatemalans. What's your sense of the political uh, that basically the United States favors uh, granting asylum to re refugees from those countries for with which it has political for which it politically supports? That's always been the case with asylum. Uh, asylum is supposed to be a universal, universal standard protecting individuals fleeing persecution from any country. But in practice, it's always been a political tool wielded by the United States to favor those fleeing regimes that the United States opposes. Now, it's actually really interesting with the Ukrainians. Um, the United States does not grant asylum for general conditions in a country. So generally, you, I could not get asylum as a Ukrainian just because my country is at war. Um, so all of these, most of these asylum seekers, the 10,000 who've been processed um, from Ukraine actually probably wouldn't qualify for asylum under US law. Whereas many of those who are turned away, including Russians who are fleeing the same conflict, I've spoken with dozens of Russians here in Tijuana who protested the war against Ukraine have been brutally repressed by the Putin regime, fled you know the same issue and are have been turned away from ports of entry and are waiting here in Tijuana. Now they would actually qualify for asylum under U.S. law, but are being turned away under uh, the Title 42 policy. So it's uh, I think there's two things happening here. One is certain nationalities are being allowed to even access humanitarian protections in the United States while others are being turned away. And then once in the United States, um, whether or not they gain asylum is, is really a political question rather than a legal one. Um, and, of course, the Homeland Security uh, Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was born in Cuba, is a Cuban refugee in the United States. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, 
the fact that um, you have Ukrainians giving shelter in indoor facilities, um, while Haitians, Central Americans and others have had to sleep on the streets or makeshift camps outside ports of entry. And finally, um, um, to ask you yourself, Erica, the kind of work that you're doing. Um, it, the Trump administration, right, was sued, the ACL sued, on your behalf, because you were targeted by the Trump administration as they monitored and surveilled your um, immigration advocacy work, if um, there's a difference under the Biden administration. I have seen signs that, um, very clear signs that the surveillance of my work continues uh, under the Biden administration. Of course, it's not to the same extent that it was under the Trump administration, um, during which I was detained in Mexico, removed from Mexico at the behest of the U.S. government. Um, I am now in a very different position where we are in more of a stakeholder relationship with the Biden administration. Um, but just with respect to the situation right now, I can tell you that um, had I done, or ha even if I today would do um, for a Central American migrant what Ukrainian Americans or others helping the Ukrainians are doing for the Ukrainians, I would be in federal prison. And I will give you an example. Um, these trips, like I mentioned, are being financed by U.S. citizens. Um, in many cases, U.S. citizens have put Ukrainian refugees in their cars and driven them up to border officials. I absolutely believe that we should do everything we can to help people fleeing unspeakable violence, including the Ukrainians. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. But again, had I done the same thing or would I do the same thing for a Haitian migrant? If I put them in my car and just drove up to the border, I would be put in prison for smuggling. So even that double standard where, you know, those helping white migrants are given unfettered access to the ports of entry, are given, um, you know, are processed at a clip of a thousand a day, where those of us trying to organize on behalf of black and brown migrants are persecuted for the same activities. It's really just, it's, it's hurtful, honestly, and it's really astounding to see it play out like this. Erica Pinedo, I want to thank you for being with us, immigration attorney, policy and litigation director of Al Otro Lado, a binational nonprofit helping immigrants on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, speaking to us from Tijuana.